So we had the super computing event here in Denver, and uh, you're wearing a red hat right now. This is a red hat day. What's going on? Yeah, so uh, I'm John Masters, uh, Chief Arm Architect at Red Hat. Uh, and today's kind of an important day for us here at Red Hat because uh, we just shipped Red Hat Enterprise Linux for Arm after uh, seven years of uh, research and development and activity that's led up to this day. So it's a huge milestone for us. Um, and it's not the end, it's the beginning of uh, a multi-year journey uh, that we call our multi-architecture future. So we work across many different architectures at this point, uh, and ARM is uh, one of them. So uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, launched. Uh, what does morning. it mean to have all this launched? Well, what does it bring? So uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is um, our flagship Linux distribution uh, that targets the enterprise. Um, and what it does is it brings a common uh, experience across many different architectures uh, that, you, that, that customers choose to run. So um, if you install uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for ARM, you're getting the same experience that you would get, say, on you know, one of the uh, incumbent architectures, like uh, x86, whether that's Intel or AMD, or uh, Power, um, or, uh, or System Z for uh, mainframe. So you get the same? You get the same experience, yeah. That's the, uh, that's the key. So if you look over here, the, there was, um, uh, maybe you can go back one slide. Uh, so you are standing right there with the Qualcomm Centric 2400. What are you running on? A um, whole bunch of stuff? Yeah, so there's a couple of things we're showcasing in the booth here. Uh, we are showcasing uh, a system we launched today, which is actually uh, an, an HPE system that we launched in collaboration with Cavium. Um, and it's called the Apollo 70. And what it is, we'll come around here and I'll show you. What this is, is a two socket. Can you it up? Yeah, I will, yeah. This is a, uh, this is a two socket 64-bit ARM server. So when I say two sockets, what I mean is um, these, these are, this is one machine. So it's not like an embedded device where you know, these might be two different computers or something like that. Uh, these are two sockets of one machine. So each socket has up to 32 cores, uh, and each, uh, each processor, each socket, uh, has up to four threads per core. So in, in, in one configuration, that could be up to 128 threads uh, per socket times two. So 256 uh, threads, if you want to configure it that way. Now, in HPC, a lot of people don't, uh, don't configure uh, their machines that way. They, uh, they really want to get the maximum uh, single-threaded performance. So they'll probably turn off the multi-threading feature, and they'll instead go with um, the uh, 28 or 32 uh, core configuration. But then you double that. So you're looking at 56 or, th or, or 64 uh, cores uh, that they can use in one machine. Um, and these are very, very high-end cores. These are uh, comparable to uh, the other architectures out there, whether that's x86 or, 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 or other architectures. So, um, and in fact, this particular platform, the selling point is, not only is it very close to the performance you see on other architectures, in terms of memory throughput, it's actually 33% better uh, than the, uh, the incumbent solutions. So uh, there's a compelling reason for customers to be interested, and that's what drove our uh, launch today. Uh, as HPE announced the Apollo 70, uh, we also uh, co-launched uh, the Enterprise Linux product. And now, as I mentioned before, uh, the Enterprise Linux product targets uh, 10 different, well, I, I think I hinted this to you uh, separately, but this, this uh, product targets 10 different microarchitectures. So, uh, in fact, more over time, but right now it runs on 10 different implementations of the ARM architecture. Uh, and that's from many, many different vendors. So, companies like Cavium here, um, and then also uh, other companies like Qualcomm. And the video I was playing in the background here is actually a demonstration. Uh, well, I guess it'll repeat in a second. The video you're going to see behind me is actually uh, taken from the, uh, the Qualcomm Centrique uh, product launch last week. Um, and Centrique is targeting a similar set of market uh, customers. Um, and what we were showcasing with, with, uh, with, with Qualcomm was uh, that, that our ARM story is really a multi-vendor story. 
right? Whether it's Cavium, whether it's Qualcomm, uh, whether it's a company that was formerly uh, uh, Baycom or Applied Micro and now is called uh, uh, Denver Project Holdings, uh, it, it doesn't really matter which company you're working with because you're going to get the same experience. And each company will have an opportunity to differentiate and add value of their own. And so Cavium with this two socket uh, system here is, is really bringing a certain set of characteristics. And then Qualcomm with their single socket solution um, is targeting a, a, a similar set of customers, maybe with different workloads. Uh, and what we did at the, the launch last week there is we showcased this uh, technology we have called RDO, which is uh, used to stand for Red Hat Distribution of OpenStack. And now it's a, a, it, it really just goes by RDO. And it's a community project to enable OpenStack uh, across different architectures and uh, in, in a Red Hat uh, uh, distribution friendly way. So it runs on Fedora, it runs on RHEL, uh, it runs on other uh, compatible operating systems. And um, what I was doing here is I was showcasing uh, that when you're on an ARM machine, this happened to be a Centric, it could have been a Thunder X2, the, uh, the Cavium platform, um, but when you're on one of these ARM server platforms, not only can you run RHEL, but then you can start to enable the other technologies. So here we're running uh, a, a, an OpenStack cluster in a box, and I was showcasing that, you know, here, here you can see this, in this video, I'm going into uh, the, uh, the management console here, and I'm just showcasing, see if I click instances here, and then I say RHEL 7 demo, and I say, you know, I want to create a, a RHEL 7 instance, and I click on RHEL 7.4, okay, and I just, I just launch it. And then in a few moments, uh, the video will show you, show me, uh, you know, logging into that machine and configuring it. And here we go. I'm going to ping it, this VM. And I'm going to configure it and play with this instance. And then you'll see behind me, you'll see some more of that in a moment. But the the fundamental point is, now that we have RHEL, it's the enabler to all of the layered technologies that we have as a Red Hat portfolio. And so you're going to see Red Hat engaged in all these communities, <laughs> enabling technologies like RDO. And then as these technologies get enabled, when there's the customer demand and the right market conditions, then they can become uh, products. Uh, and that's always based on what our customers are asking for and the timing the customers are asking for. Because you can't ship everything on one day. But as I said, we do have uh, builds of all of these layered technologies that run on top of a RHEL foundation across every architecture. So um, this is a work you've been do you've been working on this stuff. We've been doing videos for a bunch of years, right? Yeah, uh, I've wanted to make this video for a long time. And uh, for example, HP has done the Moonshot, and then yeah. the, uh, they were doing something before Apollo, also. Yes, yes. Um, so everything is uh, leading up to something, and yes. something is happening. Something special right now. I think so. I think the uh, the the problem we have in the industry is that. Um, well, the challenge we have is that everybody's optimized around a common solution that they already see, have. Uh, the timeline? Yeah, yeah. We can jump into the timeline. So, yeah, you can see here that, you know, 2011, we start the team in March, and then we have a series of te technology milestones here as we work on, what the, on our enterprise group, our early access program, dev previews, leading up to our product launch. Uh, and so you asked me about, um, you know, what. what sort of why have we had these different technologies up to this day and, and how is it that we, we, uh, we've we taken so long perhaps to, to, uh, to see ARM server adoption at, uh, um, at scale. And I think the reason is that the industry is optimized around uh, a certain way of operating that it has for years. So, you know, a two socket system with a certain level of performance and so on. And I've believed for a long time that we have to give customers that same experience with ARM uh, really, as a as a as a, uh, as, as a as you know, planting a planting a, a you know a flag and saying you know this technology is ready and you can run your workloads on it, um, and that's something I've pushed the ARM vendors to do because that's not my place to go and uh, create the market, but I give them feedback on on how I see technology being used, and I think that requires a certain level of performance and it requires a certain uh, level of capability uh, that we didn't see there in some of the early platforms. Now, perversely, I think there's an opportunity um, in the future for some of those other concepts to really take hold. Now that we have a two-socket uh, server system that's at a high level of performance, that's got more than a terabyte of memory and all of these features, we're able to go back to some of these folks and say, well, sure, you can run that if you want, 
Um, but maybe you don't actually need to have that high level of performance because maybe all you're trying to do is attach a workload accelerator to your machine, a GPU or something else, and really all, maybe all it's doing is spending its time marshalling data to and from the CPU, or rather to and from memory. The CPU may not be doing much work. And so these platforms that we've announced over the past week, or the market has announced, and then uh, that run RHEL, um, what they do is they show the industry that ARM is not a toy, ARM is a mainstream server, it's able to run real workloads, and then what you're going to see is you're going to see a level of adoption, I think, as people realize, okay, I could run a workload on this, and then they're going to look at it and they're going to say, well, maybe I don't need to run every workload on a high-end core, maybe I can run it on a smaller core. So maybe the technologies that you mentioned in the past, like Moonshot, I think they were just ahead of their time. They're not a bad idea, in fact, they're a good idea. Uh, it varies, really, depending on the, uh, the, the environment. And, and I'll give you one more example. If I'm building at scale, yeah. uh, I may actually uh, look at a technology that's uh, kind of wimpier core, like you mentioned the Moonshot platform, which I think is a good platform, uh, and, and uh, you might look at it and say, well, uh, I, have to, I have all these different cartridges, and each one has a lot of cost associated with having memory and other features, and I may get a cost saving by simply going for that two socket model, because that's how I've built all of my existing infrastructure. So I think that's what we're going to see first, but then over time, as some of these new technologies take hold, you're going to see um, ways that we can, in some sense, return to some of these other ideas. All right, so, um, so you're giving people a lot and letting them uh, scale down from there. Exactly. Like that, right? I think that's how the industry works, because uh, as I said, the industry is, is used to working one way, and so we have to give it what it, it, what it expects and what it thinks it wants. And then what I think is going to happen over time, you know, you know the, uh, the, the joke with Apple was always that uh, you know, Apple would give you exactly what uh, you know, they thought you wanted, right? Well, they're in a position in the market where they're able to do this with technologies. I think the ARM vendors are not yet there. So what they have to do is establish a beachhead and establish themselves in the market as you know, not wimpy cell phone processors, but really high-end capable uh, machines. And they're going to do that with some of these designs. They're all able to run the same OS. Uh, so from a Red Hat point of view, uh, our customers were able to have the same experience. Whether they choose to adopt on ARM or x86 or Power or you know, System Z, the, the mainframe. Uh, and in fact, what you're going to see over time is you're going to see uh, new market potential. Because the purpose of this is not to be uh, subtractive or simply to replace you know, a Power or an x86 or a mainframe machine. There wouldn't really be much of a point to that. The reason we're involved here is we see opportunity, or our customers rather, see opportunity in new emerging markets. So HPC is always an interesting space because everyone is looking for innovative designs. You know, Moore's law is basically dying, um, and as a result, you're not getting that performance increase year on year. So the, the national labs and others in the, uh, the HPC ecosystem are saying, you know what we're going to do is we're going to try ARM um, because we think that gives us a path uh, in addition to the other technologies out there, uh, to try uh, new and novel approaches. But then what you're going to see as a result of the traction that ARM is getting is, I think, greater adoption in other areas that are new business growth for Red Hat. And that includes uh, edge computing, that includes IoT, and that includes telco. And we see a lot of interest from the telco community right now. They'll be able to take platforms like this one, maybe not optimized for a telco environment, but they'll be able to take these mainstream platforms that can run REL, and they'll be able to build some very interesting solutions with that, and then they'll be able to go back to these OEMs and these vendors, and maybe drive some solutions that are more tailored to uh, the, uh, the problem space that they're operating in. And what's the business model at uh, Red Hat? How so, does it work? So Red Hat's business model is very simple. Uh, it's a subscription-based model, so customers do not buy REL. Customers buy a subscription, um, and then they're able to choose which version of the operating system they want to install. Now on ARM, it's fairly straightforward because there is only the version that we launched today. But over time, you could see a model in which uh, it's essentially similar to the other architectures, where a customer has a subscription, that means they have access to the Red Hat technologies, and then they choose the release amongst a, an available set of releases that they want to install uh, based on their environment. So for example, on x86, we have customers that are not even yet running RHEL 7 because they've got uh, established uh, uh, setups that are running and they don't want to disturb them. And so the part of the value of the subscription is that they're able to get support on older versions of the operating system. And the same thing would be true here over time. 
Uh, but it's key to point out that customers don't pay for RHEL as buying a boxed product. Customers buy into a collaborative model in which they pay a subscription and what they get is this kind of investment that drives a lot of the technologies that we're building here, right? It's the support. It's exactly, you're, 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 you, could, you could look at it that you're taking out the insurance policy, right? We build some wonderful technologies, but you know, you've seen over the past few years, you've seen uh, you know, some, some uh, uh, security exploits have happened in the industry and, and, and other kinds of issues that come up. And what Red Hat is, is uh, the, part of the value of Red Hat subscriptions is that we get ahead of all of these things and we address them ahead of time and we roll them out to customers in a way that's consumable uh, when they need it. And the other thing that we do, actually, is we work very heavily in upstreams. So I mentioned technologies like OpenStack and Ceph and, and uh, even virtualization, things that we don't yet have a comprehensive portfolio for on the ARM architecture. But what's happening is we're engineering these and we're taking those, the, the investment that's coming in through subscriptions and we're driving the upstream development of open source. And then as a result of that, we're able to offer that to customers in a way that's consumable, consumable by them. Because a customer really doesn't want to sit there and figure out every single way to build OpenStack and get it working. What a customer wants is to come to us and say, you guys are the experts, you make this work for me because I've got a workload I actually want to run. I don't really care about the rest of it. I want you to solve that problem for me. And that's the value that Red Hat offers. By getting upstream, by developing these technologies, as we have done for the last seven years on ARM, that's led to RHEL today, and then over time, we will enable these layered offerings that bring even more value to customers. And uh, all these guys at, at uh, Red Hat, there's some of them here, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, top end uh, guys that you work, you've been working with some of them. Yeah, for that's a long right. Time, right. I think I can. I trying to point out some of my colleagues here, but there's a gentleman here in a suit with uh, glasses, uh, Jan Fischer. Uh, he's in our product marketing organization, and he owns the uh, multi-architecture product marketing, so he's been involved with uh, the ARM offering and also with the Power 9 release we had last week, because we do have a multi-architecture strategy now, so it's not just about you know, ARM, it's not just about x86, it's really about having a multi-architecture future. So Jan's been very heavily involved and very, very grateful for the work he's put in, and he certainly has helped to organize this year's supercomputing presence, which I think is going very well. Uh, we have a, a great uh, uh, virtual reality demo here as well. Um, and more beyond, beyond uh, those of us who are here, we've got some folks here for you know, public sector, uh, government customers, and, and all the kinds of folks you would expect to be uh, at supercomputing. Um, we also have a very large team of, uh, of heroes inside Red Hat who have made this happen. And uh, one of them, for example, Brendan Connaboy, uh, he and I were the original creators of the ARM team. So I was the one pushing to make the team. And then what, what happened was uh, my VP, Tim, who uh, has been amazingly supportive the whole time, and, and really it, it does take that kind of support to, to, to let you uh, do this for seven years. Uh, you know, Tim, I, Tim said to me in his office, I showed him a, a Beagle board actually, one of the small uh, ARM uh, embedded boards, and I told him, this, it was a small 32-bit board, I said, this will be a server one day. And we went through all the reasons why we'll get there. You know, we need to be a 64-bit architecture, because we don't care about 32-bit. We need standardized platforms, all the things that we eventually built, together with ARM and the others. Uh, but I'm walking Tim through this, and he said, well, this is great. Technology sounds good, you've got the, the right ideas here, this, this could go somewhere, let's, let's do it. But he said, John, you know, you're time optimistic. You know, I'm a, I'm a good technologist, I think, but sometimes I, uh, I imagine that uh, amazing amounts of stuff can be done in, in very little time. And so uh, my colleague Brendan was brought in to help me with that. Uh, and Brendan is a fabulous uh, uh, technical guy. He really understands uh, what's going on. But even more than that, um, he really understands from having run many uh, uh, projects in our embedded engineering organization, um, he, he really understood how to drive things to completion over time. So I would come up with these uh, sort of technical ideas and concepts, and he would then help us to execute those with the team that we had. And we had a small team to start with, so it was very crucial to have someone to kind of be the taskmaster and keep things going. Um, and then over time, uh, it's expanded. So now there are not, not just 10 people working on ARM as it was in uh, early 2011, but now there are, uh, I, I like to say, 10,000 people working on ARM inside Red Hat because everyone's involved in ARM on some level. And in fact, every time we build software inside Red Hat, it is built for every architecture at the same time. So there's, there's no longer any notion of uh, an architecture being special. Every architecture is the same internally. And uh, so, so, and you've always, you always been pushing ARM, pushing the industry, pushing the narrow, mm -hmm. pushing everybody 
uh, towards this goal, this vision of the, the meeting you had seven years ago, maybe, but uh, kind of like uh, it's important. You've been playing an important role. Yeah. Say. Well, I wrote a uh, an email in uh, 2011, um, and in that email to the team, uh, is a, there's a loudspeaker behind me. So I'm going to just repeat this in a second. Actually, when uh, when okay. they. My, my, my mic is uh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'll say it again. So, so uh, we started the team in March, uh, March 1st, 2011. And so uh, when we started the team, I sent a welcome email to everybody. And I itemized what I thought would be the things we'd have to solve. So standardized platforms, standardized boot architecture, standardized SOCs, um, all the things that Red Hat needs, because we can't play with ARM as an embedded business model. That's not what we do. We have to have one common operating system that runs across every system. So I itemized all the sorts of things that we would need to solve, and then we worked out how are we going to do it. And so this is what led to the creation of groups like uh, the enterprise group inside Lenaro. And the enterprise group inside Lenaro was started by four of us, myself and, and, and three friends from other companies, uh, HP, uh, Arm, and, uh, and, and one other. And, and we got together and we basically drove the creation of these different industry efforts. And then, for example, the, uh, some of the server standards, you know, I wrote the first version of the SBBR, which is the boot requirements for ARM servers myself. Um, and now ARM has a whole bunch of people that, that work on this and um, some great friends at ARM. I mean, there's some amazing friends of mine at ARM there. Uh, they work on uh, evolving the SBSA and they've actually recently announced a program called Server Ready, which is a uh, validation uh, program that really allows you to say something is an ARM server and not an embedded device. So we came up with a lot of concepts early on for how this would play out over time. And what I do every year, actually, is I send this email that I sent to the team in 2011. I send it out as a kind of happy birthday email. And we go through kind of where we are. And actually, it's amazing how, you know, I'm not a, I, I, I don't think I have a magic uh, perception of how the industry works. But I think if you've been around long enough, you can tell the sorts of things that are going to be needed. Uh, and it's been quite interesting to see how it's played out. I haven't been 100% right, but I've been very close on a lot of things because you know, we know how enterprise works, we know how we have to uh, address it, and we've been able to give some really strong guidance to the ARM vendors. It's up to them to go and build the technology and make the market, um, but we've been very, very engaged, and uh, you know, I regard them all as family in that sense. And I'll tell you one other thing that's been very, very rewarding for me, and I think for the company, is co-engineering. So on some other architectures I've seen in the industry, you know, kind of the engineering happens within one company, and then they engage upstream, and, and, and then they get engaged with the Linux uh, vendors and so on, and that, that works pretty well. But in the ARM case, what we've been able to do is get involved during the silicon design, and during the early days of um, the design of these platforms, even during the bring up. So for every single ARM server chip you, you've ever seen, pretty much, um, I was there in the lab when it first came back from the fab, helping with the bring up, helping to get uh, operating system software running, of course, uh, standard Linux kernels and so on, but also making sure that RHEL was running very early on. Um, and really building up a relationship with all these companies. And it culminated in this program we have with HPE uh, called the Comanche program, the Comanche Collaborators. That was our code name for the engineering platform that became uh, the system that HPE announced today, the Apollo 70. But the, uh, the collaboration that we've had with HPE has been a little bit unique uh, compared to some other uh, platforms where We've actually worked in partnership with HPE, with Mellanox, with the National Labs. We've all had very early silicon. We've all been working out the bugs together. And what it means is we're building a much more capable platform as a result, because by the time it ships, we have done a lot of battle testing ahead of time. And uh, right here are some uh, beautiful hardware. And, uh, yeah. Let's, let's have them all, uh, let, let's have the whole ARM servers thing happen. I, I right now. you know, it's it, seven years of my life, as I was saying a lot today, uh, it's been a similar amount of time for a lot of people, actually, in the industry, and um, we always thought it would be a 10-year journey. So what I'm looking forward to now, now that RHEL's there, is building the next wave. And the next wave is when it gets really interesting. Customers building deployments, customers having good experiences, and then customers asking for higher uh, layered products that go on top of the RHEL foundation. 